In Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead, the narrator, an elderly minister, is writing to his young son. The minister had his son late in life, an occurrence that parallels the stories of Abraham and numerous other biblical characters. But now the minister is sick, and he's dying, and he knows that his son will soon be without a father. So he writes to him part love letter, part memoir, part spiritual autobiography. One summer day, he's watching his son and his son's friend play in a sprinkler, and he starts thinking about baptism. He says, when I was in seminary, I used to go sometimes to watch the Baptists down at the river. It was something to see the preacher lifting the one who was being baptized up out of the water, and the water pouring off the garments and the hair. It did look like a birth or a resurrection. He continues to reflect more generally on baptism, and then writes to his son, You two are dancing around in an iridescent little downpour, whooping and stomping, as sane people ought to do when they encounter something so miraculous as water. When they encounter something so miraculous as water. In our country, we don't really tend to think that much about water. We use it daily, but we usually do so without giving it much thought. Until water takes a different form or meaning, or it suddenly is scarce or overly abundant. And then we begin to pay attention. I spent the better part of yesterday playing with water. When water falls from the sky and freezes, we get very excited. Like the young characters in Gilead, we run and jump and play. We sled down hills and throw snowballs at each other. We marvel at the miracle of water. Water itself is subtly powerful. We think of it as gentle and soft, but it has the power to destroy homes or entire cities, and even to carve out great canyons. Water is a tremendous agent of stability and survival and change in our world. Have you ever noticed how God takes ordinary things like bread and wine and oil and water and turns them into something extraordinary. God works with us and with creation to show us over and over again that God is present in everything. Ordinary elements that we encounter every day have the power to transform us, 
They take on new meanings. They become symbolic of something beyond their common uses. They become a conduit of God's love and presence with us in that very moment. Today, we celebrate the miracle of water. Today, we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. In this story of Jesus' baptism, which is incredibly rich in symbolism and meaning and mystery, we're given the model that was adopted for our own Christian initiation rite. And it was adopted as such because of the miracle that happens in the midst of the water. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. This was not an accidental meeting. Jesus didn't just stumble upon John in the wilderness. This was very intentional. Jesus sought John out and asked, in fact, he insisted, that he be baptized, even in spite of John's objections. I imagine John leading Jesus into the water somewhat reluctantly, but also with a strong realization that he was participating in something that was somehow much greater than he understood. I imagine Jesus wading into the cold water of the Jordan, feeling the power and momentum of that water as it rushes by him. We don't know how Jesus was baptized, whether he was dunked or immersed or whether water was poured on his head, but it doesn't really matter. All that does matter is in that moment, God incarnate, the creator incarnate, was cleansed by the creation. In that moment, the sinless one, who didn't need to repent, underwent the baptism of repentance. Think about that for a moment. First, God puts the fate of salvation history in the hands of a young mother. Jesus is born as a tiny, helpless baby, and now as a man, Jesus humbles himself yet again to be baptized. Mary, Joseph, and the dozens of people who helped Jesus grow up, and now John. God works through us. God encounters everyday people who are living their lives and doing their thing and says, it's time. I need you for this. Jesus was baptized by an itinerant preacher who lived in the wilderness, who dressed and ate like he was the prophet Elijah. This is not at all what was expected of the Savior of the world. But the story doesn't stop with Jesus' water baptism. It's just getting warmed up. Just as Jesus comes up out of the water, the Spirit descends on him, and a voice from heaven says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Here is one of the only places in the Gospels where we see all three persons of the Trinity at the same time. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all present in this moment. And the wonderful thing is that this theophany, this manifestation of God, is not just for Jesus. It's also for those around him, and it's for us as well. We're given visual details. The Spirit looks like a dove and it alights on Jesus. We're given auditory details. The voice from heaven speaks and we're told what it says. But the voice from heaven, interestingly, does not address Jesus. It addresses those around him, at least John the Baptist, but probably some others who were standing nearby. The voice says, This is my Son, the Beloved with whom I am well pleased, making clear to everyone present Jesus' relationship with God. I believe that each time that someone is baptized in Jesus' name, God blesses us with these same words. This is my son or daughter, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We are, all of us, children of God. 
And when we turn to God, we profess our faith as we commit our lives and lead our families in the way of Christ, I believe that God is indeed very pleased with us. But like Jesus, our story doesn't stop there. It starts. The affirmation that Jesus received from God was important for many ways, but one of the greatest is that it gave Jesus the strength to begin his ministry. In all four Gospels, Jesus' baptism is the first action that we hear of him taking as an adult. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' baptism is immediately followed by his temptation in the wilderness. In all of the Gospels, his public ministry begins very shortly after his baptism. And isn't it similar for us, too? We are baptized, and in the process of living into our baptismal promises, we encounter temptation, but we also all do ministry in a whole huge variety of ways. Our baptism is just the beginning. The initiation into our faith and into the family of Christ that is the church. It's up to us to live into our baptismal vows to claim our place as daughters and sons of God. So on this day, as we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, and as we prepare to baptize the newest members of our church family, may we also each remember our own baptisms and live into the call to which we have been called as we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord.